always put that down to uh, luck that he survived. I now realize that that's completely untrue. It is not luck at all. I'm lucky he was involved in the war from 16 onwards, because what we're going to do now is look at the major developments in the war between the beginning of it and the end of it. And it starts with, with this little thing here, okay? 1888, we come up with a, basically a treatment, for, a, a preventative for typhoid. Typhoid was the big killer of soldiers. In the 17th, 18th century, camp fever, typhoid, caused by basically polluting in water. But you could now get your typhoid, A, a week later, B, and you were resistant to typhoid. What difference does that make? Well, the answer is this. You're the Boer War, yeah? Mm -hmm. 21,000 soldiers will die in the British Army. Out of a guess, how many die from enemy action? 7,000. 14,000 die of disease. 140,000 are sent home. By the way, during the war, one third of recruits to the Boer War are turned down, which is why in 1902, a Liberal government brings in free school milk free school dinners and PE in schools for boys and girls. Why for girls? Because they want them to have bigger babies because they make better soldiers. So we have something that we associate with the Nazis but in 1902 from the Liberals. Key thing then is this. This one actually is labelled up the anti-tetanus serum. Tetanus was a big killer of animals and labourers and of course soldiers. If you're wounded Unless you get a jab of this, then you are very likely to get locked jaw, which means in the worst case, you actually, your jaws close, you can't eat or drink, you arch your spine up as you go into muscle spasm, and you probably die as you break your spine. How charming is that? However, this is made from horse blood, on the basis that if you're dobbing, you step on a piece of sharp stone, you cut your hoof open, if you get tetanus and die, what's a shame? You're dead. You're called Dobbin. Dobbin steps on it, yeah, okay, other Dobbin, and this Dobbin steps on it, shrugs it off, and he's now resistant. So all you do is you synthesize the horse blood, and you now give everybody a jab. So anybody wounded coming in immediately gets a jab of anti-tetanus serum. By the way, there are about six million soldiers in the British Army. There are six million doses given. Hang on, that means everybody got wounded. No, it doesn't. My granddad had two doses. You got the idea. So the key thing is, from the very beginning of the war, we're starting to make developments. One of them, very straightforward. This is a field dressing. Can you show us where the field dressing goes? Here we are. Sergeant shows you where it goes. It goes in that pocket there, so you know where it is. You don't allow on the battlefield, actually bleeding from the chest, going, Oh, where's my bandage? Where is it? You need to know where it is. Everybody gets two. Why do you get two? Bullet hits you in the arm, what happens? Straight through, two holes. That's why you've got two. However, in the conditions of trench warfare, the big killer are shell fragments, shrapnel. This comes in in 1915. This is the shell dressing. This is designed to go not on the wound, it goes in the wound. You push it in the wound to stop you from bleeding out. Very importantly, to stop that bacteria getting in. In the Boer War, we fought in the veldt, the desert, it was sterile. Go to basically northern France and Belgium, it's lovely, fertile fields. How's it fertile? Manure. You get that manure in your wound, in the Boer War, what we used to do was called primary suture, clean the wound up, sew it up, not a problem. Do that with any bacteria in it, you've got beautiful conditions, anaerobic atmosphere for gangrene. And the only way to stop gangrene is amputation. However, Dakin and Carroll, two, one British, one French guy, came up with a system which allowed us to use a bottle of solution and then rubber hosing. And Dakin Carroll comes in in 1915. What we now do is we leave the wound open we make sure it's sterile and covered in gauze. We put that into the wound, that to a bottle containing Usol, Edinburgh University solution of lime. Every 20 minutes, we flush out the bacteria. It stinks, it's horrible, makes the bedding wet. Everybody hates it, but the wound granulates and at the end of it, 
You've still got an arm hand you can use, you go back to the front line. Of course, in 1915, we had some other things. One, socks. Very important socks, because the men standing in the trenches got wet feet. They suffered from trench foot, otherwise known as immersion foot. One way of stopping it is basically supply the men with whale oil to rub into their feet, because whales don't leak, do they? Therefore, it should stop you from getting water into your feet and a pair of dry socks. So the medical officers are sending forward bandages, they're sending forward things that you're going to need, but they're also sending forward a pair of dry socks per man per day. And by 1917, trench foot is a matter of discipline. If he gets trench foot, I'm in trouble, because we're in a buddy team, I am responsible for his feet. If I don't check them, rub them, put them in my armpits to keep them warm, and make sure he puts his dry socks on, if he gets trench foot, I'm the one that goes to prison at the end of the war. So it's a very good way of motivating you to do this. We get some other things. April 1915, the Germans, they're over there, they use gas. Oh yeah, on it goes. Known to the men as the boogie-eyed monster with a tit. Uh, that's not you, by the way. It's worn so that actually when you breathe in, you breathe through the medicated fabric, you breathe out CO2 through the tit. And that's what you're going to wear. However, they're introduced within weeks of gas being used. Result of that is, this one and a better one that comes later, our death rate from gas is 3%. Not the big killer we imagine it to be. Basically, as you already know, having put it on, gas is what they call an embuggerance in the Great War. It's not necessarily the big killer. The big killer, shell fragments. However, one of the areas that you're most likely to get injured is the head. Why? Because you're in a trench. In 1914, nobody has steel helmets. Nobody at all. Why not? Because we're in the open. If I see a German over there coming towards me, I shoot him in the body. Once we dig trenches and that shell explodes and the fragments go up and the debris comes showering down, it's not going to hit me on the ankle, it's going to hit me on the head. So, late 15, steel helmet comes in. What happens to the number of head injuries once the helmet's introduced? It goes up. What happens to the number of motorbike accidents after mandatory motorbike helmets came in? It went up. What happens to the number of fatalities in both cases? It goes down. That's the five strange thing, because once you've got a helmet on, you think you're safe. Well, you're not, because this will not stop a bullet. And obviously here, our one here, covered in hessian, to make it blend in with the trenches, somewhat compromised by the Geneva Cross. However, we've got some other things going on. One of the other things that goes on is that early in the war, if you come in with massive blood loss, yeah, not much we can do for you. We can give you a cup of tea. That's lovely. However, what we then get is a system where, in fact, let's just stand that upright, we get this. The use of blood transfusion. But early in the war, what would happen is, you come in wounded, you come in actually with, I don't know, a bad tooth. We say to you, if you give a pint of blood, yeah, we give a pint of blood, we will give you 10 days at home. Now you get 10 days a year. You've now got 20 days, three weeks. Is that a good deal? I like that. It's better than a cup of tea and a biscuit, believe me. But what we would do is we'd put the recipient, yeah, on a low stretcher, the donor on a high stretcher, because we're going to use basically gravity invented by Isaac Newton, yeah? However, if you've got a head wound, you will have high blood pressure. What happens? goes the wrong way. You get more blood than you need and you lose it. Therefore what we start to do is we draw it out from you, the donor, into a bottle. We then put that in the back of the fridge and we leave it there. You want to mix it up with the yogurt for breakfast. And next morning we put it up and in 1915 we go, oh no, it's gone all solid. What's happened? It's clotted, yeah? Therefore we have to add sodium citrate which now stops it from clotting. We'll keep for at least two weeks. And then we give you a pint of blood, you've been wounded, you're all pale and sweaty, and suddenly you go, oh, Doc, I feel a lot better. Brilliant. 
We give you the same pint of blood. Well, it's, it's not the same, but you've got the idea. You go purpley, blotchy, and you stop breathing and you die. What's happened? Blood type. We now know about blood groups, so what we now start doing is working out with our patients when they arrive what their blood group is. And by 1917, we have blood banks set up. I'll let you into a secret. Right now in Ukraine, soldiers, male and female, are having to give a blood transfusion before they go into battle. Now clearly that's in their interest, isn't it? Could there be another reason why you might get a patient, or potential patient, to give you a pint of blood? I'll give you a clue. The body responds to the loss of blood by basically kicking in the immune system. It starts to overdrive the immune system, which means that when you actually get wounded, your chances of making a recovery are higher than if you haven't given a pint of blood. Oh, by the way, we learned that in Vietnam, just so you know. But we get some other things going on. So by 1917, we've got that. So we've got the Day King Carroll system of stopping you getting gangrene. We've now got anti tetanus serum. We avoid you getting typhoid. We are now in the situation where in the Great War, the largest number of people that are going to die will die from enemy action. That was never true before. In their war, the Napoleonic War, one in seven men died in battle. The other six died of disease. So clearly it's an enormous leap forward. But the next leap forward is some sort of odd things. For example, this. This is the Thomas Splint. Now, Thomas Splint is developed by Dr. Thomas, amazingly, in Wales, because that's where people call Thomas come from. And he worked in the mining industry. And he was very familiar with miners breaking their femur. Now, it's the longest bone in the body. It's also the strongest muscles. So when you break a femur, the ends of the broken bone are pulled together by the muscles, causes agonizing pain, shock and blood loss. So, let's go from this end, shall we? 1914, you come in with a fractured femur. You survive, I don't know how. You die, you die, you die, you die. It's an 80% death rate. But when this comes in in 1916, the leg goes through here with the boot on, because what you need to do is put a bandage around that V and around the boot so that what we can then do, very simple, put a little piece of stick, a windlass in here, turn it round. As we turn it round, the, the bandage gets shorter, what happens to the ends of the bones? They pull apart and eventually your patient will go, oh, that's a lot better. And at that point they get the anesthesia, at that point you then deal with everything you need to do to sort them out. But until then you need them conscious, they will tell you when it's worked. So, now, <coughs> 1914, we know death rate is frankly 80%. You come in with a fractured femur in 17, you survive. You come in with a fractured femur in 1917, you survive. You come in one in 1917, you survive. You come in with a fractured femur in 1917, you survive. Sorry, I don't know what went wrong here, but <laughs> that's the fact it is. Come and join us. The key thing is that we completely change it. Result of that is this. I'm going to make you the British Army in the Great War, okay? If you're wounded, what percentage of you will return to your mates? 80%. What percentage of people suffering from shell shock will recover? Not, perhaps not perfectly, and return to their mates. 80%. If you're the German army in the Great War, yep, 13% of you will die. If you're the French army, 16% of you will die. Why? Because they don't put their doctors on the battlefield. They keep them back. If you're the British army, now remember, commanded by the well-known butcher called Old Haig, I'm being facetious here, what percentage of you will die? 11.8%. 88% of you will go home. So the key thing is, you want to pick an army to be safe, join the British Army. And the key thing is, all of that recovery rate is down to doctors, nurses and medical developments. And as one final point, 1914, you're a pilot of the Royal Flying Corps. You can fly 150 miles. No bombs, no machine guns, no radios. Just you and an aeroplane, okay? You can hop the channel, get a saw at Saint-Omer, refuel, go out, 
look at what's happening, drop a message. You two are all cock and brown. This is not 1914, this is 1919. You're now flying a Vickers Vimy. The big bomber could fly from here and bomb Berlin and come back, all right? We never did it, because we didn't think it was fair. Later on it would change. The key thing is, you're now in Nova Scotia. Where's that? New Scotland. It's Canada, yeah? We're going to give you an aircraft and say, we've replaced the bombs with fuel. We're going to let, ask you to fly east from Nova Scotia. Where do we hit first? Greenland? Keep going. You're slightly too north if you do that. You're going north east. You fly straight east, you're going to hit the UK. And you two fly 1,500 miles and then you crash land because you mistake a marsh for a field. But, you know, we survive. So 1914, 150 miles. 1919, 1,500. This lot here is a similar rate of development. Basically, without the Great War, we would have caught up around, around 1938. Just in time for Second World War. Which would have been the First World War, of course. But more importantly, there's one thing missing from my lovely methods of treatment. Penicillin. We don't get penicillin until the Second World War. And then, obviously, that is a complete game changer. I hope it's giving you an idea. And I hope so giving you an idea that when I say about my granddad, can you show me your left sleeve, please? Okay. We have one of these. That's a wound strike means wounded, recovered, returned to active service. My granddad would have had four. I've seen one guy with seven of them. And the only man to get two Victoria Crosses in the Great War could have been a sniper, I suppose, or a pilot. Any idea what he was? It's a doctor. Noel Chavas, son of the Bishop of Liverpool, gets his first VC in 1916 for going to no man's land. His second one in 1917, wounded in the abdomen, he stays with his men for two days and dies of septic shock two days later. He didn't know he got a second VC. But it says an awful lot about the way that we value our medics that the guy with the only two VCs in the Great, Great War is in fact a medic. By the way, there was another one, a man called Colonel Martin Leake. He got his first VC in the Boer War, second in World War I. Guess where Noel Chavas died? The hospital operated by Colonel Martin Leake. And you can go visit his grave if you're on the road between Poppering and Ypres, whenever you want to pop in and see him. Obviously, he likes visitors. And by the way, he didn't know about his second VC. So, there's a lot going on here. All I've covered very rapidly is the major medical developments. Thank you very much. By the way, thank you. Uh, yesterday we had ten visitors here with my talk, so it's lovely to see all of you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, leaflets coming round about a permanent... Sorry. Yeah.